Hello everyone and welcome to the next session of Digital VE Days. My name is Silas Zorn and I will moderate this webinar today. The topic of today is DC Link Capacitors for DC, link, for DC Charger Applications. Our speaker today is Lukas Hölcher, who is working as a technical project, project engineer at World Electronic ISOs. The webinar today is recorded and will be about 30 minutes long. Unfortunately, Lucas is not available today. This is the reason why we cannot make the Q&A session after the presentation live. Sorry for that. But you have the chance to write your questions in the Q&A tool and then Lucas will answer them via email in the next days. You can find the Q&A tool on the, uh, below on the right side on the question mark button. Last information for you, you will all receive the link to the recording of the day and the uh, presentation in the next days. So now I wish you an exciting and interesting webinar. Yeah, thanks a lot Silas for the introduction. My name is Lukas Hölcher. I'm technical project engineer for capacitors and resistors. And the topic of this session is DC link capacitors for DC charger applications. At first, we will start with some DC link applications. I will give their general overview. We will discuss a uh, specific design from Onsemi, which is a 25 kilowatts DC charger. Then I want to give some general information about DC link capacitors and which technology you can use there. For example, film capacitors and also aluminum electrolytic capacitors. Then I want to do a short comparison of these different technologies to compare the advantages and disadvantages. After that, I want to present some approaches to, yeah, to determine the minimum capacitance value. And um, yeah, before we were talking about the capacitance value, um, later on we will talk about the maximum capacitor ripple and how you can select the right capacitor. Yeah, the last point are other important selection criteria which you should um, think about when you do your DC link capacitor design. So let's start with the DC link capacitors or the DC link application in general. Um, you can see here from the left hand side the three phase AC mains, and then you have the rectifier, and then an inverter, for example, and on the other hand side you have the three phase motor. And in between you have the DC link capacitor. So the question is now which technology can you use for this capacitor? You could use DC link film capacitors, or you can also use aluminum electrolytic capacitors. For some applications, you can also use MACC, but uh, these are more or less only uh, interesting for higher frequencies, because for higher frequencies, you could use uh, also smaller capacitance values. So let's talk a little bit about some general DC link capacitor applications. For example, um, if we're talking about electromobility, you can find them in onboard chargers, or in EV chargers. And if we're talking about renewable energies, then you can find them in, for example, solar inverters or other inverters connected to renewable energies. But you can also find them generally for higher power applications. So let's talk a little bit more detailed about one specific design. You, you can see here an 25 kilowatts fast DC bidirectional charger from Onsemi. And if we are starting here now from the left hand side, we have here the three phase AC grid with an bidirectional bi PFC. And on the right hand side, we have the um, bidirectional dual active bridge, uh, which yeah, enables bidirectional energy flow basically. And in between, we have the DC link capacitors. And we worked here very close together with Onsemi and managed here to, yeah, to implement our DC link capacitors into 
this design. So let's uh, talk a little bit about how the um, actual board looks like. Um, you can see it here from the left hand side, the three phase rectifier with PFC. And you can also see here the um, three DC link capacitors. And on the right hand side, you can also see the bidirectional uh, DC DC, the dual active bridge. And yeah, uh, like I told you before, we have here three output capacitors and also two input capacitors from the dual active bridge. And we have also some output capacitors from the dual active bridge. But if we're talking about the DC link capacitor itself, then we are talking about these five capacitors in total here. So these are, are building up the DC link capacitor. So let's talk a little bit more detailed about the different technologies which we could use for DC link capacitors. The film capacitors, if, uh, if we're talking about film capacitors, you could generally divide them into metal film capacitors and capacitors which are based on a metallization on dielectric. If we're talking about metal film capacitors, then it's basically made of, you have, um, you have one metal film and one other dielectric film and this hole gets wound up. So yeah, you have basically two different films. And on the other hand side, talking about the metallization on dielectric, um, we have some dielectric material and some uh, metallization on top of it. Um, today I want to talk mostly about plastic film types, so MK types, and also very specific about MKP. So MKP basically means that we have metallization on dielectric, M. The K stands for, for Kunststoff, which is an, a German word for plastic. And then we have also the P, which stands for polypropylene. So MKP, polypropylene film capacitor. Um, now I want to talk a little bit more about the DC, our new DC Link series, the WCAP FTDB. Um, we offer here one microfarad up to 75 microfarads. The voltage is from 500 volts up to 1200 volts. And as I told before, we are using here uh, polypropylene as a basic material because it has, um, in comparison to the other technologies, it has very good um, properties, especially talking about the dissipation factor and also some other properties. Um, the temperature uh, range is from minus 40 degrees up to 105 degrees. One big benefit is the ripple current capability and also we have self healing properties and a very long expected load life. So we were talking about the, um, the inner film of the DC link film capacitor. Now I want to give a little bit more information about how it really looks like in the inside of the DC link film capacitor. So um, if we have a look at the, at the inner structure, you can see here the um, you can see here the polypropylene film, the two layers of polypropylene film, and on top of these layers you can see the metallization. And this whole structure is a little bit, or the, the top layer is a little bit shifted to the right, so that you can, that we can do here from the outside our connections, um, um, yeah, our, our outside connections. And after that, this, this whole structure gets wound up, and we will put it into the, this case here and fill it with uh, some self-extinguishing resin. So that's basically the, the main production process for desealing film capacitors, for sure. It's a little bit more complex than that, but this is uh, the basic here. Um, yeah, we have also some self-healing behavior for desealing film capacitors. For example, if we're talking about um, the inner structure. Um, for example, if you have, for whatever reason, you will have um, some small defects um, in the dielectric material. For example, if you have some mechanical stress or something like that, which could lead to a, to a small defect. And if you're currently also applying voltage, 
then this will lead to a very short time, um, short, short circuit. And this also leads to the fact that um, for this short time, the, um, yeah, you will have a really high current uh, or also a very high current density, which also leads to the fact that um, the metallization layer on top of, these, of this dielectric material um, yeah, will be vaporized. So this leads to the fact that you will have no longer um, a short circuit current path, which leads to the fact that the, the capacitor um, has a certain safe feeling. So let's talk a little bit more about the data sheet values or about the specification. For example, if we have a look at the, the ripple current, for a specific DC link capacitor, you can see that the ripple current for this part is um, fairly high, in this case 25.7 amps. But um, yeah, you have to a little bit a little bit to look on the test conditions. Normally, if we don't state anything here in the column of test, test conditions, the test conditions would be 20 degrees Celsius with 35% relative humidity. Um, so like, like stated here. But, and we also um, specify for the data sheet, we also specify here um, 15 degrees of, of self-heating there. Um, some other information is um, the voltage derating and current derating, which we show in our data sheets. And there is some interesting point that we, that we, um, that we give you the information that you have to derate the, uh, the applied voltage starting at 85 degrees Celsius for the, for the voltage. And why it's, why it's 85 degrees Celsius? Because that's the region where if you, if you would use this, this capacitor over a long term at, um, at a, a temperature higher than 85 degrees, then this could lead to a, to a change of the, um, yeah, of the physical behavior. And if we're talking about the, the current, then the current derating starts at 70 degrees because we also implement here the maximum self-heating, which is directly um, implemented into the, um, into the applied current there. So let's talk a little bit about the lifetime. We also give some information about the lifetime in the data sheet and also in Red Expert. And as you can see here, the aging basically depends on voltage and temperature. We have also some effects of the uh, air humidity. So the air humidity will always accelerate the degradation of the metallized film. And we should also take care that um, the aging will finally lead to a capacitance drop or to an ESR increase, also to a tangents delta increase. The leakage current will also increase. So let's talk a little bit more about some aluminum electrolytic capacitors. The construction of the aluminum electrolytic capacitor is shown here. And you can see that this, this um, if we are start starting with uh, the cathode foil, you can see it here. And then we have the, the anode foil, which is, which is shown here, so a little bit above. And then we have the separator paper with liquid electrolyte in between. And additionally, we have some rubber seal to protect the, the inner winding from drying out. So that's always the issue there. We should uh, protect the inner winding from, from drying out there. Um, this capacitor, which I show here, is an SMT capacitor, but the inner structure of a snap-in capacitor is yeah, comparable. Um, it's a little bit different because we have more terminal taps for, for some capacitors to, to reduce the, the ESR there, but um, basically it's, it's, more, it's, it's very comparable. So let's talk a little bit more about the detailed inner structure. Um, from the left-hand side starting, we have um, the anode foil, then we have some, some oxide layer, we have um, the paper with electrolyte on, and on the right hand side we have the cathode. And you can see that um, this black layer is 
yeah, is uh, thicker than, than this one on the right hand side. And um, the thickness of the oxide layer, um, yeah, will be um, adjusted by applying high voltages during the manufacturing process, uh, which is called anodic oxidization. So basically, this means that if you're applying here some voltage over this capacitor, then these, um, this oxide layer can repair itself and will, will build up again. So that's also some, some self-healing there. So before we talked a, little, a lot about the inner winding and electrolyte and so on, um, yeah, but one of the biggest topics for aluminum capacitors is always the lifetime. So if we are talking about the lifetime of aluminum electrolytic capacitors, then you will always find these, this formula here, the Arrhenius formula, uh, which is base, based more or less on the, um, on the initial specified lifetime and also the, um, the maximum specified temperature, also the ambient temperature and also some self heating. So you can see that the temperature really influences the lifetime. But we have also an effect of the, of the self-heating. And yeah, where is the self-heating connected to? The self-heating is connected to the ripple current and the frequency. Why the frequency? Because the ESR is, um, is changing a little bit over frequency for aluminum electrolytic capacitor. And we have also an effect of the, um, of the applied voltage here. So, you know the basic formula now, but you don't know how the, um, yeah, the, how the ripple current, for example, has a real effect on the capacitor. So you need some, some connection in between. And to help you here, we have here from our side the, um, the lifetime calculator on the right hand side where you could implement your application data and calculate the, the right lifetime. Um, you can also consult us if you have specific meshing profiles um, yeah, to calculate the more detailed your lifetime, your expected lifetime, or if you need, if it's very important, um, if you need some temperature sensors, we could offer you also support you with some temperature sensors here. But we will do this only for, for some special projects. So let's do a short comparison of the film capacitor and the aluminum electrolytic capacitor. So if we're talking about film capacitors, film DC link capacitors, then we have very high RMS current capabilities. We have several amps per microfarad. We have rated voltages up to 1200 volts, no liquid inside, long storage life and load life. And we have also self-healing properties. If we're talking about aluminum electrolytic capacitors, then we have high capacitance values, um, the highest capacitance per volume in this case, also a very high capacitance per volume. We have a relatively high ESR. Um, yeah, we have a relatively high ESR, which leads the, to the fact that the ripple count, which could be applied on this capacitor, is, is lower than um, for DC link capacitors. The rated voltages are up to 650 volts. We can do some serious connection um, for higher voltage level, but then you have to think about some balancing and, and so on. So um, let's think about the real calculation of the DC link capacitor for your design, for example. Um, at first, we have some design requirements, for example, DC bus voltage, rated power, switching frequency, um, some other very important design parameters are um, yeah, the, the current ripple which you have in your application or the total capacitance which you may need. So if we compare film capacitors and aluminum electrolytic capacitors for the same space and cost, this will lead to the fact that you, um, for film capacitors, you will get a very high RMS which you could apply on these capacitors. Um, but also a low capacitance. And for aluminum electrolytic capacitors, it's vice versa. So the result is also for film capacitors that you will have 
um, a high lifetime and also the bet or the disadvantages here that the voltage triple will be fairly high because the capacitance uh, will be lower. And yeah, so we're, you have some other topics which you uh, could think about um, for, the DC, for the aluminum electrolytic capacitors. For example, startup issues, safety issues, and so on, because with higher capacitance, you have to think a, a little bit more about these, these items. So let's talk a little bit about the minimum capacitance value. Um, I, yeah, I want to show here some different formulas um, to determine the minimum capacitance value. Um, so basically the first formula is um, for a Vienna rectifier, which is from an, a TI reference design. Uh, I always show here the, the reference in here. You can check it uh, afterwards. Um, the, the second formula, so formula 21, is based on a um, rectifier which is not controlled. And formula 22, um, which is for, for our side uh, most interesting, is basically a low pass filter formula. And uh, formula 23 is uh, for an inverter application. So, but we are mainly talking about formula 22. And um, yeah, how did I calculate these capacitance values? I used an um, I used the, the um, an Vienna rectifier with a load of 25 kilowatts, and then I did some simulation of the dominant um, DC link capacitor ripple peak peak value. And then I added here the target DC link voltage ripple peak peak, and then I calculated the um, capacitance value. But it's very important that this one is really yeah, a low pass filter design or impedance based design. And there are also some other design requirements which may lead to a higher capacitance value. For example, that um, the capacitance value yeah, depends really strong on the on the load and the current which the, the load drives, and also some fault right through capabilities uh, should be. Yeah, you should think about them. Um, talking about for for some applications, a higher capacitance could be also required um, for the storage of re regenerated energy to avoid that the DC link voltage is not too high. So you really have to think about. Um, these different effects there. So it's just only for your reference. Um, then I did a little bit of simulation with these different capacitance value um, yeah, for, um, for an active front end rectifier. And you can see here that um, the formula 20, 21, which are very high capacitance values, these, um, this line is in the 800 volts region. And the, the formula with, which fits the best is formula 22, which is the yellow one. So we really get our target here. Our target was 1% um, DC link voltage triple. So this really worked out here. And then I did the, the calculation also for calculation and simulation also for different frequencies. Um, I used for this approach the, the Vienna rectifier. I had a constant load, so that's very important. I had only a constant load, and for your application, this uh, could change here. Um, I, was, um, I started here with the um, initial frequency of 10 kilohertz, and then um, I always well, I increased the frequency, but for every step, I um, simulated the, the um, DC link ripple current and calculated again the, um, the DC link formula or the, um, the DC link capacitance. And I did this for every frequency. And also what I did also, I was um, I reduced also the inductance for each frequency. And basically uh, the result shows here that uh, if you increase the frequency, then you can really reduce the DC link capacitance um, to get the same, uh, the same behavior of the DC link voltage ripple. So what you can also see that you also can um, yeah, decrease the, um, the input inductance here. But yeah, I have also to say here, 
this is only for reference and it's really uh, changing um, up on the, the current which your load, load actually drives. So let's talk a little bit about the current. Um, before we talked a lot about the capacitance value, now I want to give a short overview about um, how you can select the right capacitor. And for this approach, uh, I want to show you the, um, the Red Expert module of aluminum electrolytic capacitors and also aluminum polymer capacitors. And what is important here, if you want to select the, if you want to get the right ripple count at your frequency and temperature, um, we added here some factors for the frequency and for the temperature. And for example, if we have the use case of 23 amps at 10 kilohertz at 65 degrees Celsius, um, the first step could be always to, to filter for mechanical dimensions. But the second step um, can then be to enter the frequency here. So you can just enter the frequency. And later on, you can also enter the temperature on the second graph. And in the end, this will lead um, to the fact that then there appears an additional column for the current at your specific, specific temperature and frequency. So this is very interesting. And then you can really filter your parts. Um, yeah, and also afterwards, very important, um, check the lifetime for your selected parts. So you can just click on this and enter your items for the lifetime calculations. So now I want to do a little bit of a bank design example. Um, we have here our, our use case are also 23 amps root mean square at 10 kilohertz at 65 degrees Celsius. The capacitance value is 76 microfarads at end of life. And the required um, rated voltage is 880 volts in total. And I also selected these parts based on minimum of 10 years life expectancy. Um, I used only standard parts from our side. And one other important selection criteria is that I only selected the, the smallest combination of these two different technologies. Um, the first technology is aluminum electrolytic capacitors and the second one is DC-Link film capacitors. And so if I, if I do this, then this will lead to, to this selection. And you can see here that for the aluminum electrolytic capacitors, I need in total eight capacitors, two in series and four in parallel, because for the high, I need more capacitance for the high current. And for the DC-Link capacitors, I need only one in series and two in parallel because I, had, I have not enough capacitance in here. So if we're talking about the basic design, then this will lead to a higher capacitance value for aluminum electrolytic, which is a benefit because um, it really can reduce or it really reduce the voltage triple. Um, based on my simulation, it was um, the voltage triple for, for this 25 kilowatt um, design or for this simulation, which I mentioned before, um, the voltage triple is about three volts and for the dc link film capacitors, it's about six volts. But if we are talking now about the ESR, then you can see that the ESR for the film capacitors is way lower in comparison to the aluminum electrolytic capacitors. And this finally leads to the fact that also the power losses for film capacitors are way lower in comparison to aluminum electrolytic design. So basically, uh, with this comparison, you can see really the benefits of both technologies. Aluminum electrolytic can offer higher capacitance values, but uh, if you're using film capacitors, then um, yeah, this can really reduce the losses. And also for some certain applications, you can also reduce the volume by selecting these parts. Now let's talk, talk a little bit about some other important selection criteria. For example, the ripple voltage. In our data sheet for the DC-Link film capacitors, we also show the information that the ripple voltage should not be um, greater than uh, 0.3 times the uh, rated voltage. So that's very important. Um, you should mention that, or you should think about this. And some other important selection criteria 
are also um, yeah, aging over, over lifetime. We already spoke about this topic, but it's very important that you um, take this into account. The capacitance value um, can decrease. Um, the ESR will increase. The dissipation factor will also increase. And for example, if you are thinking about some serious connection, then it's important that you do some overdimensioning of the rated voltage. Um, yeah, which is which is basically necessary there, and also you have to do some balancing there if you are, um, are connecting them in series. So this is also very important. And if you need some additional support, please consult us. We are really happy to help you there. So let's do a short summary of what uh, we just discussed. Um, at first, I gave you an overview about some applications, some power converters. We talked a little bit of, about the on-semi reference design, the 25 kilowatt DC charger. And then we did a comparison of um, DC link capacitor types, film capacitors. I talked a little bit about the self healing effect. Uh, we talked about electrolytic capacitors, about the lifetime, about the selection in Red Expert, and then we did also a comparison of these different technologies. After that, um, I showed you some formula about you could estimate the capacitance which is required for your DC link. And then we did some bank calculation and I mentioned also some other important selection criteria. Yeah, here you can find some references which are very important, I think. So if you have some applications this, in this region, um, yeah, it could be helpful to, to look um, for these references. Thank you, and now I'm happy to answer uh, the questions.